Hey everybody, John Mark here. Welcome to Mark My Words. Today I'm going to talk to you about reciprocity. I'm going to explain to you why this needs to be the basis of our rule of law. It needs to be the basis of our civilization. Why it is the grassroots right wing instinct wrapped up in one word. And why it is the grassroots right wing's one word narrative to counter the left's one word narrative of equality. And by the way, it also cuts like a knife through butter when it comes to the elite's narrative, which is profit even if it imposes costs on others. So this is the grassroots right wing's one word narrative and I'm going to explain to you why it is so powerful both as a basis of law in our civilization and as a way of scientifically and empirically communicating our moral authority as grassroots right wingers. This gives us a new level of ability to quickly and easily explain why we have the moral authority. Before I get into it, two very important announcements I'm really excited about. Number one, I now have a new way that you can support me financially in addition to Patreon and it is actually a replacement for Patreon as well. So I'm going to stay on Patreon for a while because I don't want to disappear out there and kick anybody off. But I am going to encourage all of you who are financially supporting me and who want to financially support me, you can now financially support me at rationalrise.tv. Just click on the Patrons button at the top of the screen when you get there, and I'm going to be telling you more about this in the future. I'm going to be interviewing the founder of RationalRise.TV, James Fox Higgins, and he's going to be telling us all about this. I'm really excited about it, so I'm not going to go into it now, but one of the things that it does is for a content creator like me that is hooked into this, it is a replacement for Patreon, but that is not all that it is. I'm really looking forward to interviewing James and telling you more about RationalRise.TV in the future. Right now, it is operational. You can go there and you can support me at various financial levels, just like you would on Patreon. Second announcement, I'm really, really excited about this. Kurt Doolittle and I are going to be doing a series of videos on my YouTube channel, conversation slash interview style, where we are gonna be going through the Propertarian Constitution article by article. And the idea is that it will be kind of a modern Federalist Papers. If you look up what the Federalist Papers were back in the day, it was writings by men like Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, laying out why the Constitution that they were putting in place should be the way it is, having a conversation around that. So I'm really excited about this. I don't know exactly when we're going to start, but we are planning to do that coming up soon. You are not going to want to miss that. All right, let's get into the content reciprocity. What is so powerful about reciprocity? Well, let's start with why it is so powerful as the basis for a civilization. In propertarianism, we talk about reciprocity as natural law, the natural law of reciprocity. And we have a very specific definition, which you can see on your screen. The reason this is the foundation of civilization is because there can be no cooperation and no trade between two parties without reciprocity. If there is some type of interaction between two parties and one of the parties violates the definition you see on the screen, there will be a retaliation cycle that begins. Somebody's going to get angry. If you look at this definition, you say to yourself, when I interact with someone or with another group, this is how I want them to interact with me. And if they violate any part of this definition, I get angry and I don't like it. Now, the thing is, human beings, individuals, and groups will often seize opportunities to violate reciprocity when they think they can get away with it and get some gain from it. But every time they do that, they start a retaliation cycle because the people that they're violating reciprocity towards look to retaliate. So the whole job of rule of law is one simple thing to stop violations of reciprocity before they turn into retaliation cycles. To give the people of a polity, of a nation, of a group, the ability to go into court and resolve the retaliation cycle in court before it turns into a bloody massacre. Let me give you more on this. There are only three choices that human beings have when interacting with each other. We can either fight, or we can leave each other alone, or we can cooperate in some way, trade in some way. 
by far the most profitable of those three choices is if we can cooperate and trade in some way. That brings the most benefit to everybody. So if your system of law does not allow people to violate reciprocity and nips violations of reciprocity in the bud and doesn't let them get out of hand, what you are doing is you are forcing everyone into either cooperation or leaving each other alone. In other words, you have peace. And when you don't let people be parasites, when you don't let them violate reciprocity, when you punish them for doing that, the other thing that's happening is you are forcing all of the people in your group to actually provide a product or service that is valuable to other people within the bounds of reciprocity rather than letting people make their living by being parasites. And when you do that, you unleash the potential of your population of people. For example, let's just take a simple example. Let's say you can stop the mafia from being the mafia because all they're doing is going around and being bullies and parasiting off of everybody through force. Let's say there's a person that grows up and maybe they would have become a member of the mafia and gone around being a big parasite. But what if they're kind of a clever person and instead of doing that, they end up inventing something that's a benefit to everyone and using their cleverness for the benefit of others and making their money honestly. Do you see what I'm saying? Let's take that example further. If you let the mafia operate, you are creating a situation where a ton of people whose lives are negatively affected by the mafia have to figure out some way to defend against the mafia themselves. Or they have to spend a bunch of time and energy figuring out how to pay this basically mafia tax to a mafia that doesn't provide any benefit to anybody. So you're gumming up the entire works. It's like throwing sand in the engine of a Ferrari. Your people can have the potential to be a Ferrari, but if you allow corruption and parasitism in your system, the people's potential cannot be unleashed. So that's the basis, the empirical basis for why reciprocity is empirical morality. You hear people saying all the time, we should do this, we should do that. Most of the time, they don't have any empiricism behind that. It's just their instinct. And we grassroots right-wingers also have an instinct. It happens to be a civilization-protecting, civilization-advancing instinct. But if all we do is express it as an instinct, like we should do this, we should do that, or that's bad, and we don't have any empirical basis for it, it is not as powerful persuasion-wise. Now understand, we're not going to persuade the left. That's not the goal here. But there are people in the center that do listen, and there is a critical mass of people that can be swayed by understanding who has the moral authority. So the grassroots right wing, when we insist on enforcing reciprocity, we absolutely have the moral authority because we can state empirically, if you allow violations of reciprocity, you will have a buildup of conflict. You will have retaliation cycles and you will hold back the potential of your people group. And yes, some people will benefit from the parasitism in the short term, but it will come crashing down on their heads eventually because the people who are suffering the violations of reciprocity are going to say at some point we've had enough and they're going to retaliate. So if you want peace, reciprocity is the answer. If you want prosperity, reciprocity is the answer, enforcing reciprocity. So that's the empirical scientific basis for why reciprocity is empirical morality and why it is our rallying cry as grassroots right-wingers. And I've found that grassroots right-wingers instantly latch on to this idea of reciprocity. They instantly understand it and they instantly say, yes, this is basically our grassroots right-wing instinct in one word. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. And then you look at the definition on your screen and you say, yes, this is what we need to enforce. And all these other people that are our enemies, they are violating this at every turn. Everything they do that we don't like is a violation of reciprocity. So not only does reciprocity capture the right-wing instinct in one word, not only is it empirical morality, and we can demonstrate that empirically, but it's also a very powerful way for us grassroots right-wingers to convey our moral authority in one simple word. This is very important because for many years, the left has had a one-word narrative. That one-word narrative is equality. 
It's a very nice one word way for them to convey their opinion that they have moral authority. And if you don't want equality, they say you are a bad person. And for years, the grassroots right wing has been in a position where we're trying to argue against that assertion by the left with like a long litany of facts, which works for a certain percentage of the population. But there's another percent of the population that that doesn't work on much. So again, we're not going to convince the left with this, but it is very important that we are able to articulate why we have the moral authority. This is very, very powerful. So when we say we want reciprocity, that is very, very hard for human beings to argue against because they're stuck in the position then of saying, I don't want reciprocity, which is an open admission that they're just trying to get away with something, that they're a thief. And the reason this is so powerful is because the left's whole game is to be a thief and to pretend like they're not being thieves and pretend like they're good people who just want equality. Well, the word reciprocity cuts through that like a knife through butter. No, we insist upon reciprocity. And then they're stuck in the position of saying, well, I don't want reciprocity or I don't like reciprocity, which is a very difficult position to be in because every human being instinctively knows that reciprocity is good and any violation of reciprocity is bad. Everybody knows that. And folks, I've experimented with this a little bit and leftists have a very, very hard time with this word. They don't know what to do with it because it turns the tables on them. They don't know how to argue against it because they instinctively recognize if they argue against it, they are just admitting they're a thief. So every grassroots right winger needs to understand why reciprocity is empirical morality. Every grassroots right winger needs to memorize the definition of reciprocity that you see on your screen. It is not difficult. If you can memorize the Pledge of Allegiance, you can memorize this. When we have our own areas to rule over after a shakeout in America, this must be taught in every school, every grade. It must be recited as often as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance now. This is our anthem. Reciprocity, reciprocity, reciprocity. And you say, well, it's kind of a long word. Well, it's one syllable longer than equality. It's not that difficult. And everybody instantly understands the morality of it. This is our one word narrative. This is the foundation of a healthy, strong, prosperous civilization encapsulated in one word. I'll close with this. The term reciprocity also cuts through a lot of political confusion that people have in their heads. If you listen to my recent full length interview with Kurt Doolittle, one of the things he said was, and I'll say it in my own way, it's not capitalism versus socialism, it's reciprocity versus parasitism. The way Kurt said it was, well, when people are talking about capitalism, what they're actually trying to talk about is reciprocity. When they're talking about socialism, they're actually trying to talk about parasitism. That's one way to say it. The other way to say it is, let's just toss out these inaccurate terms, capitalism and socialism, which is a dichotomy that Karl Marx came up with anyway. Let's throw those words out because they're not clear enough to describe what's actually going on and what's actually important about different interactions. Let's replace those terms with reciprocity versus parasitism. So for example, if you say I'm a capitalist because you run a company and you have employees and you make a profit, but then you insist on dumping your waste product into the river that flows down a few hundred yards and hits a town and makes people sick, well, you're violating reciprocity, but you can still call yourself a capitalist. And then people start with language like, well, it's crony capitalism. People don't really have good language for it. The language we need to use, clear, accurate thinking, is reciprocity versus parasitism. This company is violating the definition of reciprocity because they are doing something that has a negative externality, a negative effect on somebody else. Yeah, they're just selling their product to their consumers, but then they're also doing something that has a negative effect on somebody else. If you dispose of your waste responsibly and properly in a way that doesn't hurt anybody, then suddenly you're back within the definition of reciprocity and you're not being a parasite. You're not imposing costs on anybody. 
You could say the same thing about the corporations in America today. They've made so much money because they're founded their company out of a very high trust civilization, Western civilization. And then they just want to import people from all these other civilizations that vote 70% left and 70% of them get into this anti-white lies, this anti-white identity politics, and demonize the very people that built the civilization that they're benefiting from. And the corporations encourage it because the corporations, I'm talking about the big corporations now, they just want warm bodies because it helps their bottom line. It drives down the price of labor and it's more warm bodies to buy their stuff. The problem is they're destroying the very foundation of what enabled them to be prosperous in the first place. They are not acting in reciprocity. Something that they are supporting and pushing for, mass immigration from the third world, is imposing many, many costs on the people of the nation. It is a negative externality that violates the definition of reciprocity. Bankers are violating the definition of reciprocity. Those of you who understand it, understand that. We could go down the line. But a banker might say, well, I'm a capitalist. Well, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean you get to do whatever you want because you're just making money and that makes it okay? No. The clear, accurate language we need to program our brains and program our civilization with is reciprocity versus parasitism. And we understand the definition of reciprocity, we memorize it, and any violation of that is parasitic and must be stamped out by our judiciary. Kurt Doolittle is putting this in the Propertarian Constitution. I'm very excited to talk with him more in depth about the Constitution, as I mentioned earlier. The last thing I'll say is these three key definitions in Propertarianism, the definition of property, the definition of reciprocity, and the falsehood test, the list of falsehood tests. They all operate together hand in glove. In many cases, you cannot determine who is violating reciprocity and who is not unless you start to go through the falsehood tests. I'll give you an example. White people on the grassroots right wing and non-white people on the left in America today both feel that the other side is not acting in reciprocity towards them. Why do we both feel that? Well, the non-white people are constantly told day in and day out, the only reason your success level as a civilization and as people in America is lower than the financial and academic success level of white people is because white people are holding you down. Now, if you were told that all day long and you believed it and you really didn't know any better, they're told this all day long, it's very attractive to them. So if you actually believed that, would you be angry at white people? Yes, you probably would. And folks, keep in mind, I realize it's hard for many of us to even understand that people like this could be sincere, but keep in mind the average IQ on this planet and the average IQ of these people groups that feel they have grievances about this, their average IQ is around 85, 90. So keep that in mind. Most of them sincerely believe this. And I'm not saying they're completely intellectually honest because they're not, but a lot of people just don't know any better. And they really are angry about this because they really believe that white people are holding them down. Now they can't describe it operationally. They can't hold up their end in an argument, but they don't hear that stuff. All they ever hear is the left's narrative. So they believe that white people are violating reciprocity towards them, even today in 2019. On the grassroots right wing, we believe that this is ridiculous. Affirmative action means that every single day in America, there are thousands of meetings where white people, especially white men, are passed over in favor of women and non-white people who are either equal in ability to those white men or many times even lower in ability and qualifications than those white men. That's what affirmative action is. Meanwhile, as far as I know, there are zero meetings every day where white people are sitting around planning to hold down non-white people. And of course, the whole anti-white narrative is just a big case of cherry picking. So this is why I say the falsehood tests are an essential part of this as well, along with the definition of reciprocity and the definition of property. You take those three definitions together, you can solve any human conflict just by figuring out who's lying, punishing the liar, and punishing the attempted violation of reciprocity. And that is in our interests to do as grassroots right-wingers, as carriers of the flame of Western civilization, as carriers of the flame of the American spirit, 
that is in our interest to do and we can do it and we will do it because we know how to talk about it now we know how to put it in our law and we know how to enforce it and a lot of the trick of getting a large number of people on board and working together toward a goal is having the language to express what you're doing in a clear and simple way kurt doolittle has given us this language it is the language of reciprocity and you could also say the language of property and the ability to apply empirical falsehood tests to any claims that a person makes this is so so powerful reciprocity 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 that is the foundation of western civilization that is the foundation of everything we do it is our rallying cry it is our moral authority that's all I've got for you today. Till next time.